Hello. What are your impressions after the G7 summit in Brussels? What conclusions can we draw from that? Well, nothing dramatic. Are you disappointed? Uh, not at all. I think uh, the G7 uh, drifted away from the, uh, the traditional G8 agenda, of course, focusing on totally different issues. Whereupon uh, the uh, G8 agenda formulated by the current Russian presidency of the G8 uh, was sidelined. Uh, but we'll because Russia was not there. Of course. And the G7 uh, chose to discuss totally different issues. So I wouldn't mix the G7 with the G8 at this point. So it's a totally different event for you. It is. Then how would and you... hardly impressive. Hardly impressive, we know. Mm -hmm. But how would you uh, assess the logic of not inviting Russia in Brussels and inviting Russia the following day at the D-Day commemorations in Normandy? Well, you should ask those who sent out the invitations, of course. Uh, <laughs> let me clarify this, um, I would say, organizational um, side of events. Russia uh, was never part of the G7. The moment Russia was invited, G7 became G8 17 or something years ago. Uh, whereas uh, the D-Day commemorations uh, would, would have looked ridiculous without uh, Russia being there. As for the uh, claims that um, um, founded the, um, the non-invitation of Russia to, to G7, we know that Russia does not admit that there is an involvement in Ukraine. Among the, the recriminations against Russia is the fact we know that there are no Russians in Ukraine, there's no military involvement. There are many Russians living in Ukraine. There are many Ukrainians living in but Russia. But we don't have Russian guerrillas in Ukraine. We know this. But how about the other recrimination that uh, Russia applies different measures when it sells gas to Ukraine and when it sells gas to other countries? Why is Russia applying different tariffs to foes and friends? Well, you know, uh, we're not speaking about tariffs. Tariffs are is uh, something that exists internally in each country. Uh, what we are probably talking about is uh, gas prices. And gas prices, as prices for any commodity, uh, they are subject to negotiations between uh, uh, companies, uh, the company that sells the gas and the company that buys the gas. But the Russian state has a huge stake in Gazprom. A 51%. So it's a political decision? On prices, no. No, it's a market no. decision. No, it's a market decision. Of course, every uh, deal in energy also involve, involves taxes, both on the supplying side, also on the consuming side. Uh, and I will uh, not reveal any secret if I say that up to 70% of the end price that a European customer pays for gas in this part of Europe uh, goes to the state coffers of uh, his country as, as taxes, 70%. In this case, the country being Ukraine. Will Russia recognize officially the new president of Ukraine? Well, I, you know, uh, you're not the first person asking me this question, and I'm a bit puzzled because uh, what do you imply by official recognition? The Russian ambassador went uh, back to Kiev. He participated in, in the inauguration ceremony. What else would you expect? An official announcement. Nobody, uh, well, you know, countries recognize each other. They do not recognize governments or presidents. So you're not bothered by having someone in power in Kiev that wants to claim back Crimea? Well, uh, ev everyone uh, is entitled to, to, to make mistakes. How about NATO? Uh, what is Russia's position towards NATO's promises to Georgia and even veiled promises to Ukraine in some areas? Well, I think that NATO eastward expansion uh, is an unhealthy process. 
uh, be it the countries that you just mentioned or any other countries, including those that have already joined. Uh, we believe that uh, NATO expansion, uh, in principle, is an attempt to address security challenges of the 21st century with means dating back to the mid-20th century and means, I will add, de uh, devised uh, in, in totally different uh, historical circumstances and for totally different reason. Did NATO infringe any of its promises in the 90s? Did NATO promise formally that they would not expand in Eastern Europe? Well, not NATO as such, but uh, major Western countries did. They, for example, um, promised to the first and last Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, that uh, NATO infrastructure will not move to Eastern Germany, the then German Democratic Republic, it has, uh, and a lot of other promises. And not uh, sending troops to Eastern Europe and... Yes, yeah. But Russia did a similar promise in 99 in uh, the, the summit in Istanbul when it said that it will pull out its troops from Transnistria. And I was there, so... So you made the promise? <laughs> no. <laughs> It was, uh, of course, President Yeltsin at the time. But let me explain. Uh, the, uh, it was not a promise. It was a commitment to do that, subject to certain conditions. And those conditions were followed up by uh, the uh, Porto Declaration of the OSC in 2002, uh, which spelled out provided necessary conditions are in place. They are not there. What, what were Actually, the in practical terms, uh, you know, uh, Russian military presence does not have any significant military significance. Uh, I can explain if you, in a few words uh, the, the background. Yeah, please. Uh, after uh, the events in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the you mean the fall of communism? Uh, I mean the changeover of governments uh, and the subsequent pullout of the then Soviet forces and their stockpiles. Uh, some of them ended up in that part of Europe. So what is now referred to as Transnistria uh, housed a number of, uh, well, huge amounts, huge stockpiles of uh, munitions, not actually arms as such, but munitions. Some of them dating back to pre-World War II period. Uh, you know, like, so in a bad state, uh, like bullets that would not fit any modern gun and too dangerous to transport. So we contemplated various options, including uh, destroying them on the ground under international supervision. Germany provided actually some equipment to do that. There were, of course, protests by local residents who said this is uh, uh, bad for, uh, for environment, and they had a point there. So some, uh, well, more than half of these stockpiles were eventually moved out. But I don't see, think it would have been in anybody's interest to leave those stockpiles unattended, unguarded. So that was the main reason why a little over a thousand uh, Russian troops stayed to guard those stockpiles. Plus, of course, a peacekeeping contingent, which is there uh, on the basis of a multilateral agreement between the authorities of the Republic of Moldova and the, uh, the authorities of Transnistria uh, upon consent of both parties. But that's a, a very small number. There is talk now about a referendum in Transnistria, about uh, independence or reunion with Russia. Well, they already had s several of those. Would <laughs> Russia accept such a referendum? Would Russia take this country like it, is, like it did uh, South Ossetia or Abkhazia or Crimea? You know, uh, the, uh, the last time a referendum was held in Transnistria, uh, if my memory doesn't fail me, was 2006. 
which was a response to a law enacted in Moldova uh, the year before, 2005, the law which actually downgraded the status of Transnistria to just a geographical notion without any autonomous rights or, or anything. What is Russia's position? We uh, are in favor of a peaceful resolution of this conflict on the basis of uh, Transnistria being part of a federal, neutral, uh, non-aligned uh, country of Moldova. And we are uh, very actively pursuing the uh, 5 plus 2 dialogue on this, uh, multilateral dialogue on, on, on this issue. The latest round uh, having taken place, I think, last week. Speaking of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the only countries that recognize the independence of those entities are Russia, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and the island of Nauru in the Pacific. And a few others. Which ones? Some other Pacific I islands. Some countries. other Pacific islands. Yes. Doesn't sound very impressive. So Is far, no. Yes. Isn't idea. this a failure of uh, no. Russian diplomacy? No. You know, uh, after the Bolshevik re Revolution, uh, for uh, 15 years, almost, uh, the, uh, the country survived without being recognized, and it, it survived. Uh, today there are some countries that are either totally unrecognized or recognized by one single country uh, or recognized, I mean entities recognized. Let's say Taiwan, for instance. Or the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, <laughs> for that matter. Uh, and uh, actually in the latter case, there was a UN Security Council resolution urging UN member states not to recognize, specifically not to recognize. There was nothing of the sort in the case of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, well, I can also refer to Kosovo, which uh, has not been even recognized by all EU member states. Yeah, five countries don't recognize it. Yes, mm -hmm. as uh, is the majority of countries across the world. Right. Let's stay in Russia. Um, I suppose you are often asked about some laws that make Russia kind of a scarecrow uh, in political and diplomatic and cultural terms, like the law about the NGOs being foreign tools, uh, tools of foreign interference. How do you explain this? How do you uh, dilute the, the impact of this? Yeah, foreign agents. Foreign yeah. agents. Exactly. Well, the, the term foreign agents uh, applied to NGOs is not a Russian invention. It was invented in the United States of America, and the law, which dates back, of course, to 1930s, is still in force. So, uh, you know, uh, you know how many Western NGOs are are active in Russia? No, how many? About 3,000. How many Russian NGOs? Are, are able to work in Western Europe and the United States. Do you have any? Yes, two in the United States, six all over in Western Europe. And when one of those uh, applied to be registered in, in, in France, they had to fulfill uh, a questionnaire of over a hundred questions. And uh, in the uh, similar case in the United States, the list was uh, even much longer. It's, you know, it's a bureaucratic uh, procedure. A tit for nobody, tat. No, Wait. no, it's, uh, there is nothing political in that. Uh, oh. Nobody is preventing any NGO in Russia from receiving financial support from abroad. But if that NGO is dealing with political issues, then it has to register, it has to, to inform the authorities that it is receiving uh, financial assistance from abroad. If it's dealing with humanitarian issues, like you know, uh, 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 medical assistance or uh, assisting children and, uh, or anything like that, there's no need to even to register. So it's not a measure of reprisal? No. Or 
Another thing that scares here and worries people is the Eurasian ideology. That well, we are not afraid of people uh, pursuing Euro-Atlantic ideology. Why should, be, should anyone be afraid of Russia pursuing Eurasian ideology? It's just a ge geographical term. Could you resume it in a or few is it any, Or is it something else? <laughs> Well, we could already say I mean that Euro -Atlantic. we could already say that the Eurasian ideology has nothing to do with communism, first of all, because yes. it was devised yeah. by some uh, white Russians emigrated to the to the West, including uh, people figures like Trubetskoy, who was a very high, uh, yeah. uh, highly praised linguist and intellectual. So it's not to be attached with Stalinism or the uh, the Soviet ideology. But how how would you describe it in a few words? Well. Uh, if we speak about philosophy of the political philosophy, of the notion, political philosophy, uh, it's something different. If from uh, whether we speak about uh, practical uh, uh, actions, so it's like about the identity of Russia. It's no, it's about um, I would say the uh, the integral elements of what we all know as European civilization. In our view, which I personally fully share, is that European civilization today rests on three pillars. You know this EU speak, the pillars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one pillar is Europe as such, the other pillar is Russia, and the third pillar is North America, which is so closely connected with uh, the first two. So these three pillars of European civilization need uh, to interact and to, uh, they need mutual support to, well, I wouldn't say survive, but you know, to retain their uh, role in today's multipolar and globalized world. And what is Asian there? Why Eurasian? Well, you know that two-thirds, well, you, you worked in Russia, you know that two-thirds of Russia lies in Asia. And of course, you but know. But here we speak in symbolic terms, not geographical. Uh, in pol political but, but and symbolic think, terms. You know, I think something that is grossly underestimated in this part of Europe is the historical achievement of my ancestors. Uh, those Russians who lived in the 17th and 18th century, who managed, who succeeded in uh, expanding the bo boundaries of what we today know as uh, European civilization to the Pacific coast, to the borders of China. I will probably stop here without asking you a hypothetical question, which language would have otherwise be spoken across Siberia today. Mongol. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think <laughs> but that... But I think <laughs> you should be happy that it's Russian. But <laughs> Russians were for centuries under the Mongol yoke, as you call it. Yeah, a, a couple a, of a, centuries. A couple of centuries. Do you <laughs> think the, the West doesn't realize, doesn't understand the strength and the, the power of your uh, breaking free from this yoke and uh, in well, Russians among many other things that, unfortunately, the West fails to understand. So the, the West is ungrateful for Russia for having, in a way, saved Europe from external invasions. That too, yes. And how can you convince them of this by letting them have the impression that you invade a European country? Which one? Ukraine. Well, we did not invade anybody. If you are referring to Crimea, Russian troops have been there for over two centuries. And uh, in after it's the major Russian naval base of in course, the Black Sea, you know, yeah. which I would say has a lot of symbolic significance, perhaps more symbolic than strategic, but still, you know. Um, and uh, the Russian Navy was there f since Ukrainian independence on the basis of a bilateral agreement, a series of bilateral agreements. So uh, there has been a lot of speculation about the certain surging numbers during the 
dramatic events in the beginning of this year. But that was also fully in conformity with those agreements. Because, well, I, again, I won't reveal any secret if I say the, uh, the ceiling for troop numbers was 25,000 written in those agreements. And the actual numbers when this uh, turmoil in Ukraine started was 16,000. So this gap of 9,000 was filled. We never uh, denied that. To stay in the field of cultural and political influence of Russia in Europe, of course you have a long cultural history, literature, music, uh, painting, everything. Today, when Russia is seen rather as a foe in Europe, by some. by some, the only political, direct political influence you have is on some far-right parties. We had a couple of days ago a meeting. Many left parties too. And many <laughs> left parties, but fringe parties, extremist parties. And there well, was a meeting in Vienna. Some of those fringe parties actually won the European elections. <laughs> they won them in, in their countries, but yes. on a Europe-wide scale, yeah. they are still a minority. Yes. So Russia yeah. is uh, uh, approaching some of these extremist fringe parties, and there was no. a meeting in Vienna a couple of days we ago. We are not approaching them. They are, they are approaching, approaching us. <laughs> <laughs> and we are open-minded to everybody, except, of course, uh, you know, uh, parties and political groups professing uh, you know, fascist, Nazist ideology, including those in Ukraine. So you, you feel that Russia is excluded from what it would deserve? No. At the, you said we that not European civilization are, is based on three pillars. We are under, understated, underestimated. Understated. You would like to be on the same level as the United States and Europe as a whole and Russia as a third pillar. I think it's in everybody's interest. And are you optimistic? How do you see this? I'm a born optimist. That's why I chose this job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chizhov. We had with us Vladimir Chizhov, Russia's ambassador to the EU. I am Dan Alexe. We are in the New Europe studios on Plage Rodin. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for coming. Thank you.